So, real privilege to be joined by the man who was dubbed the first post-punk footballer. Hi, Pat. How are you? I'm good. Uh, very good indeed. Um, getting used to this zoomy sort of stuff. Um, <laughs> And Do you know what? Up. I'm just going to go back to, I think it was about 81, wasn't it? And I, I, used to, I was an avid reader of the NME. Uh -huh. And we, just correct me here, we, you were on the cover as, when you were outed as the, the po first post-punk footballer. It was the NME, wasn't it? It was the NME. I actually don't know if it was a cover. Um, it was an inside spread, a middle page spread or something like that. And it was very moody, kind of uh, gloom boom, kind of joy division kind of look, picture of me which was very different from what the other players were kind of, uh, you know, wearing and looking like at the time. Uh, but I'd come from a different background. I'd come from, you know, being a student, um, and I'd tried really hard not to be a professional footballer and failed. <laughs> so I ended up down at Chelsea, <laughs> which is weird. Um, but I'd been having such a great time as a student in Glasgow. The music scene was brilliant up there. Uh, the football was good fun. I played it for fun with Clyde. Um, and Chelsea had tried to buy me, uh, but I stole. And Elvis Costello saw and said, I don't want to go to Chelsea um, <laughs> for an entire year. And then at the end of the, the next season, complicated reasons, uh, I said, oh, I'll go down and try it for a couple of years. Um, although I didn't really fancy it. And uh, the rest is kind of slightly history. I was, I was gutted leaving Glasgow because I was happy. I was studying, as you say, and I was going to gigs. And you think of the music scene in Glasgow at the time, you know, late 70s early 80s you know his postcard was beginning there was lots of really good interest in young bands coming through and it was uh, it was hard to leave but then again the music scene wasn't bad in london either so it was it wasn't bad. <laughs> yeah. that first time i was aware of you off the field i i just started at uh, a radio station in stoke on trent it was 1985 chelsea played in one of the first games i ever covered there and i remember being in the tunnel waiting to do some player interviews and you would stood there and i'd never seen you in your civvies before and i remember thinking he doesn't look like a footballer he looks like johnny <laughs> marr was that a conscious effort on your part to look different from the rest no i was just looking like me um <laughs> so the people that i hung about with my friends were musicals and were into different things i'd never had kind of football style now, think about it now. I mean, I was such an outsider then, but I, I kind of thought, no, no, football style with lots of, you know, Adidas or Puma all over you, you know, yeah. even though Puma did paint me. <laughs> no, I'm not <laughs> having that. Um, and look at it now, football style is the style that everybody has, you know, but I'm still out with that. And we all have our own subcultures. There was no reason why I should join a different one just because I played football. I mean, let's be honest about it. In the simplest of terms, lots of us have jobs. We don't then dress exactly the same way as everybody else in the job. Really, right. as simple as that, not more complicated. And I just kind of kept on living my own life. And I thought it was easy um, to keep on living a normal life while being a professional footballer. And I, I think I've managed. I think I've just about managed to keep them. And I kind of tell you, quite Johnny Marr one. A man appeal that came up to me and said, you're Johnny Marr, aren't you? <laughs> and I'm at gigs and I'm going, no, no, I'm not actually. <laughs> And this guy came up once, and I was with my wife, and we were at an Aztec camera concert. And this guy came up and goes, you are Johnny Marr. I'm not. You are. No. My wife tapped and went, he's not, and I can prove it. And he went, how? Said, There's Johnny Marr over there, about 10 yards away. <laughs> you used the word there, Pat, an outsider as a footballer. Did, did, is that the way you felt? I mean, we, we all remember the, the story of, uh, of Graham the Soul, and he was kind of, you know, the guy who read The Guardian. Did you, did you feel, because you were into that scene and you looked different, did, did did you really feel like an outsider in the, in the, in the professional game? Um, yeah, but I like it. And, uh, I wanted it. Um, and the, the strange thinking was that, you know, I'd, I'd played football as a kid, you know, 12, 13, 14, I'd say for Celtic and an S form, but I didn't have much in common with the, the other football kids. I mean, I, I loved the literature, I loved other things. I wasn't snobbish about it. I just liked different things. Um, and there's no way that I, I was going to go into football and then just jump into going out. I mean, I've never had a pint of beer in my life, so I'm not going to get getting drunk with the lads, you know. By the way, don't get carried away there. I love my whiskey and I love my wine. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> Let's get this, get this straight. Um, but there's no, I was an outsider, but I loved being a voyeur as well. I loved looking at what they were doing. And I, I'll be honest with you, the more time I spent with footballers, the more I respected them. Absolutely. And I actually thought I had it easier than all of them because I had, a, I had a safety net. I could go and do something else. I could, you know, go back to what I'd been studying. I could go and do other jobs. They'd given up everything just to be footballers. Every other one of them had done the same. Um, and even Graham, you know, I, 
when I came across Graham, he was a kid at, at Chelsea. And, um, and it's great, though, because the acolyte has taken over from, you know, <laughs> me. And he gets all that sort of stuff, including the stick for being the outsider. Yeah. But when I first sort of grabbed Graham out of the youth team at Chelsea, taking for training in the afternoons, and I thought, yeah, this kid's interesting, you know, he's okay. And my girlfriend and I would take him out and take him to the South Bank or take him to various places. And in the early days, I would do something, and then he would do it. I'd say, no, no, I do something. I show you something. And then you make your own mind up. That, that's how it works. <laughs> you don't just copy someone. Like, um, and it, it, it really moved on quickly, and it moved on quickly as a player. Um, and we never actually played in the first team with each other at Chelsea. I left just before he broke into the team. But at the time, he found it much more difficult to be an outsider than I did. I found it kind of easy. I'm from uh, the east end of Glasgow, kind of rough area in the east end of Glasgow. He's a nice kid from Jersey, and it was harder for him. And also, he was going through that whole youth team stuff. Uh, so take us, take us back, Pat, to, to, to the late 70s. What, the, the kind of music, you, you were a teenager, you were at Clyde. That, that, you, know, you, you say you weren't into football, but you, you were obviously very good at it. What were, you, what were you listening to, and what was the scene well, like at the time? It has to go back a wee bit further than that, because about 74, 75, 76, and at that time, um, I would be going, in fact, can I show you something? <laughs> sure. Yeah. During sure. lockdown, during lockdown, we, we find things and clear up, right? Mm -hmm. I found, oh, tickets for old gigs. Oh, wow. So, stubs. We all love collecting them. But yeah. Stubs, right. <laughs> oh, yeah. For old gigs. Got a and I've, I've not seen them for yonks, right? So, what you got? I'm going through them, and there's a Flaming Lips one. Um, the Associates, 85. Yeah, yeah. Remember them? Right, lots of them, Radiohead. A certain ratio, I was big into them. I remember yep. then. Yeah. But the reason why I'm showing that, because this one jumped out, and you probably won't be able to see it. Genesis. Oh, wow. No. Oh, I was at the Genesis too. Which era? Up to, up to a point. Pre or post Gabriel? Um, no, I'm not quite that old. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm, if you, I'm one of these people who says pre or post Hackett. Um, oh, yeah, well, yeah. yeah. And, I, and I think Hackett was the problem when he left. Um, <laughs> but I'd been kind of big at Genesis, Floyd, Bowie as well. Um, yeah. And then, of course, Punk comes. So, I mean, so this was mid seventies. Yeah, so it was mid, you know, mid ish seventy seventy five, seventy six, seventy seven. 76, 77, I, you know, my head tells me it's that. So you know, that's the stuff I've been into. But there was other. I oddly like this band Kraftwerk, but nobody else liked either. <laughs> um, and it's, you kind of were catching things here and there, but there wasn't. The punk just kind of and post punk just drew it all together. And then I'm about seventeen, eighteen when it, that's all happened, and suddenly in Glasgow you've got all these bands coming through, and I start going to gigs. And I'll go back to the first gig I ever went to. You, should, you two should own up to this as well. Yeah. My first gig, Thin Lizzy, 1975. Wow, that's all right, yeah. Or was that Barrowlands or somewhere? No, Barrowlands wasn't even a gig. A concert there was a hall in Glasgow. Oh, yeah. Was, and, and by the way, Phil won it, which was unbelievable. What a gig, great oh, gig. Yeah, they, I think they fall into the acceptable category, uh, don't they? Thin I don't Lizzie. think they did then, but they do now. <laughs> yeah, I think they do. <laughs> Yeah, you might be right. So, uh, but, I mean, first gigs, it doesn't, I don't think it, I've got this theory, it doesn't matter how bad yeah. or how untrendy or how unimportant perhaps the band was. The experience of your first gig, I mean, it's like your first football match, isn't it? It's, I mean, I remember the first band I ever actually saw live were a band called String Driven Thing. Whatever happened to them, <laughs> I don't yeah. know. But, um, but I remember being sort of so utterly captivated by it that I thought, right, when's my next one? I've got, I've got to get mm -hmm. more of this. I mean, that's the way it goes, isn't it? Yeah, and, and it's, it's amazing because you think these things take a long time when you're younger, but it's, it's, it's lightning quick how it all changes. I mean, within a year and a bit, I'm at the Banshees. You know, <laughs> it's, and it all just turned around. Uh, coming through in Glasgow, I have to be honest with you, there was a, a wee band coming up at the time called um, Johnny and the Self Abusers, who I was kind of madly obsessed with. And of course, they then turned into the Simple Minds when they started releasing yeah. records. Yeah. And their first two or three albums uh, were brilliant. And yeah, they, they are fantastic. Life in a Day, the first one in particular, is magnificent, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, there's, there's, up until I would say New Gold Dream. Which is a perfectly good pop album, but before yeah. that, Ed Pals and Dance Song. So, all good, heavy techno, European, yeah. crowd rock, very low era, era kind of feel about it. So, but what a feeling it was. And it, it was a real kind of movement, a group of people. But while that was all happening, one era Glasgow, 
up the posh West End, you've got, you know, the postcard people, you know, and they're, you know, the, you know, the orange juice stuff. So there's a brewing number of scenes going around in Glasgow at the time. So it's a brewing place to be. That's, so so you, were pl- part of the reason. you were playing at Clyde at the time, were you? So you were at, oh, 16, I'll tell you very quickly. So before, okay. And as they go at, by the way, any, as you probably know, anyone can read this in a book, but I'm going to bring it out quite soon. Oh, <laughs> yeah, just we'll, finished we'll, it we'll, get, we'll get to that, Pat, don't worry. <laughs> but, uh, so it's, kind of, oh, it's all interlinked, and it's complicated because it's all interlinked. But, so I was a student, and I'd kind of given up football because, you know, I love playing it, but only for the joy of playing. Um, and then Clyde's, I played against Clyde's which it was supposed reserves. I didn't know. It was the first team that turns out. Played quite well, and the manager signed me up immediately afterwards. I turned him down as well. Um, but he said, I'll pay you 30 quid a week. And I went, what did I sign? <laughs> He's like, as a student, somebody actually offers you 30 quid a week and you take it. Yeah. So, you know, then I was a, I was a student uh, doing uh, my, my degree, which was economics, accounts, that business study sort of thing, but playing part-time with Clyde and going to see gigs as well. So you're 18, 19, 17, 18, 19 years of age when that's happening. But in the space of a year and a half, and it just shows you how quick it changed. I've w- walked up at Clyde. A year and a half later, you know, I've won Scottish Young Player of the Year. We'll win the European Championships with Scotland under 21. We'll win the league with Clyde, the lower league. And I've signed for Chelsea. And then within six months of that, I'm player of the year at Chelsea. This is bizarre for a kid who just wants to go and see gigs. Yeah. <laughs> and you're but, but as you said, I mean, you know, London's a fantastic scene. I imagine it didn't take you very long being a boy from Glasgow playing at a, a minor club, coming to a big club in London. And they were always a glamorous club, Chelsea, weren't they? I, I wouldn't imagine it took you too long to immerse yourself in the in the scene in London. Um, well, no, I mean, it was really quite quick. Um, I couldn't afford it at the start. I really just couldn't afford to go to gigs at the start. I mean, I was playing a year at Chelsea, and this is an absolute true story. So the first season went down, not expected to get in the team, but got in the team right away and won one player a year and we won the league to get promotion to the top division. Right? Amazing. And I played it every game once I get in. That's all exciting. I was on 180 quid a week. Um, my rent was 100 quid a week. You have to pay tax. I was surviving in London 20 quid a week wow. at the start. Now, you just basically, and I'm playing a year at Chelsea. <laughs> it's, Fortunately, we got a few win bonuses, which helped. Yeah. Yeah. But that, and I didn't mind it because I'm kind of i a normal guy. It's okay. You have to get by. You have to do it. Um, so for the first three, four, five months, it was, it was tough to get to gigs. But then it really took off. And it was a lot of really good. Well, I've still got some of the tickets sitting beside me here. Um, it was direct calm. We're playing Cocktail Twins, just arrived down. Um, a whole bunch of other bands that were, were just coming through at the right time. And I do think that early 80s period, um, was quite a phenomenal period for interest in new music. And of course, a year in London, at the time you could go to see a different gig every single night. Um, and you were, you were living, weren't you, with a guy from the NME, is that right? Adrian Fields, as I remember. That's right. So I'd gone down, I spent the first six to nine months on my own in a, a bed sitting in co uh, but I needed to get out of it. <laughs> I think the fleas on the carpet were kind of annoying me too much. <laughs> <laughs> so I got a place in Pimlico, I couldn't afford it, but um, Adrian had in, interviewed me for that NME piece you were talking about. He'd heard me talking about Joy Division and to some of the journals after one of the games and he went, what? Joy <laughs> Division fan? Playing football? And those days, nobody did know who, you hear them all saying, love will tell, gigs will tell his apartment. And you're thinking, <laughs> where were you when you were needed? You know, so, but I was a fanatical Joy Division fan at the time. They were probably my favorite band at the time. Adrian read us in the paper, interviewed us, and we just got on really well. So I said I was looking for a new flat, and he goes, well, I'm so am I. And I went, well, we'll find one together. So I ended up, yeah, sharing a flat with Adrian. And of course, the, the upside to that is Adrian would be reviewing the singles or working for the enemy. Everyone just sends their yeah. music to him. So I'm getting all this music that I used to go and have to pay for. I get millions of it for free as well, because Adrian gets all this vinyl. Um, I still had to buy all my own as well because he didn't get everything I wanted. But, and then Adrian was going to gigs. And of course, it's a great excuse for me to go to gigs as well. You know, and it was always a plus one, but I had this point. Never, ever took the plus one. Never used it. Because the bands need the money. So that was very specific about that. I only took a plus, plus one when the gig was sold out and I couldn't get I couldn't. So I would, right. Adrian would say, all right, you're the plus one for this by the NME. So it was interesting times, and Adrian was 
he was known as the, the king of kind of Scottish music, even though he was a Londoner, the king of all the jangly pop, he was pushing it more than anybody else at the time. So the likes of Honest Juice and Aztec Camera and all the bands that were coming down from Scotland at the time, he was really pushing that. And uh, so that's quite a scene that I left. You mentioned the Cocteau Twins. We sorry. We, you mentioned the Cocteaus. Um, I know they're a huge uh, favourite of yours. And the first one we ever did of these Rock and Gold podcasts was with Simon Raymond, and he talked about you taking him training um, one day and that kind of stuff. I mean, presumably at the time, um, you were more drawn towards mixing with music people than mixing with other footballers he he was telling us that you know you were dashing away from games to go and get to to cocteau twins gigs that sort of thing yeah in france <laughs> <laughs> it's absolutely true um yeah but I, it wasn't that i didn't like the footballers going perfectly well with them but if i say to the lads and team hey i'm going to cocteau twins tonight do i come like i'm getting blanks there yeah. <laughs> it's, it's yeah. not it's not an anti People always think because you're not doing the same as them, you don't like them, mm. or they don't like you, or you don't go on perfectly well. It absolutely wasn't the case. You have different backgrounds in every job that you do. You be at journals, every journal you meet, or every guy in the factory, they don't have the same interests. It's just no. work. So I didn't follow that sort of thing. So I had my own friends. And what was lovely is when you come down to London at first, it's a tough place to, to come at first. You know, and there's a thing that happens generally is that Scottish people stick by each other a little bit. So you meet other Scottish people. Richard Jobson became a great friend yeah. very quickly when I came down. Skids. Yeah, yeah, Skids. Good, good um, footballer apparently sure. as well, wasn't he as well? He was, yeah. Very good, decent player. But quite soon after that, I went to Cocteau's gig. And that, that Cocteau's gig, Simon Raymond was there as a fan. And he ended up joining the Cocteau's oh, right. just after that. And I met him after that. And... Uh, the way it went was bizarre because we met every day. We just met up yeah. every single day, went for lunch. I was yeah, a footballer, so I had the time after training, and then I'd go back and do more training. He's a musician, you know, their timings are like. So yeah. we just spent almost every other day together down the Chelsea Kitchen and King's Road. Uh, but I did take him in for training one day, and this is true. <laughs> yeah. First cross, down the line, and I said, right, I'll put her in the middle. I've got somebody going go. This is at Stanford Bridge at what is now the Matthew Harding. Yeah. Crossed it and it's behind him. I swear to God, Ronaldo at Juventus <laughs> last year. Overhead kick, leather, top corner. One of the best goals I've ever seen at Stamford Bridge. And there's Simon where he's like inhaler and <laughs> overweight at the time. What? You're making this look a bit easy. Um, so Simon could play a lot. I thought he couldn't because, um, I don't know if he owned up to you in the podcast, but he went to Charterhouse. And he didn't mention Genesis that. boys when they posh, posh public school in Surrey, Ooh, yes, isn't it? very yeah. posh, but as an Eton Harrow, and yeah. that's why I didn't think he'd be any good because he went to <laughs> yeah. But that's my bias. That's His my father story. was a, quite a significant musician himself, wasn't he? Uh, he Ivan wrote, Ray, um, he, uh, he was only want to be with you, right? arranger, yeah, he wrote some yeah. big songs, yeah. some, some yeah. fabulous big songs. So, anyway, the lovely thing is, yeah, all my, most of my friends are great, so things that I've done were in the end. People involved in either acting, music industry, you know, are just out, just away from football. Mm. And I'll be honest with you, you're asking, you're kind of digging in an area which you're right to dig in. I probably didn't make the effort to bring footballers into my other life. Um, there's a variety of reasons for that. They're really complex as well. Uh, I very specifically didn't like the celebrity world and I didn't want to be part of the celebrity world. Um, you knew you were slightly in the public eye, but I knew that as soon as I joined that, it's, it's, you know, it's, you're, you're paying a price. There is a price to, price to be paid for that. Um, and I just didn't want to join that kind of world, go to those kind of places. Um, so it was a whole fight of 19 year career. You know, be normal, do normal things. That was a very indie thing though, wasn't it, Pat? You know, that, that sort of, you know, the kind of moody sort of, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't about celebrity, was it? It was, it was about sort of deep thought and that was really suited your personality at the time, right? Yeah, well, if there's any kids watching just now, do you know the hipsters that, you know, they set up a band and if anyone claps or likes them, they go and set up somewhere else and change them. You know, <laughs> you don't want to be popular, you know. Um, but it wasn't for the reasons of harsh, it wasn't necessarily for style. I just had a, a kind of fear and dislike. It looks, I didn't like the superficiality of it for a kickoff, so quite serious, mate. I was very austere and very earnest when I was younger. <laughs> more, more than I should have been. I was 
annoyingly so, even in retrospect, I annoy myself about it. Um, but I, I knew that if I joined that other life, when I went down to Chelsea, the same week, Charlie Nicholas signed for Arsenal, known as Champagne Charlie. Yeah. Yeah. With all the blonde highlights. Yeah. Or, I don't, you know, I don't think old... he shunned the limelight, did he, Charlie? Exactly, and I loved him <laughs> for it because yeah. he took all the pressure off me. <laughs> <Nobody> <laughs> me. Yeah. I remember a picture of him. Remember a picture of Charlie when he signed for Arsenal. We had he had a sort of uh, his sort of boots are draped. He looked like Bruce Springsteen or something, you know, with his sort of boots like hanging over his shoulders. Oh, he was trying to be you know. Bono. He was trying to be Bono. <laughs> uh, but he was, you know, you were right though. It was, it was all about that kind of that glamour thing. Do you know on my screen right now, Pat? I've got, I found a, 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 in the Chelsea program. Correct me if I'm wrong. We used to do a, a singles review, a music review in the football program, right? I, well, it was actually in the newspaper, club newspaper. It was called right. the British News, and I wrote for them. Um, didn't charge them for it, um, but they'd asked me, they knew I was into writing, they said, well, could you write for us? And they thought, they obviously thought, footballer, he'll write about, you know, the dressing room and what's going on. And I went, no, it's a musical, <laughs> obviously. <Yeah. laughs> like, they were like, really? And the madness is, they went, yeah, okay then. So I had this call, which I called Hook Line, um, which had double meaning, Hook Line for a song, and Peter Hook was yeah. good as well. Um, and I'd, I just talked about the gigs, up-and-coming music, did a couple of interviews. I'll be honest with it, with you. The major reason why I said it is because I thought, if I do this, I am a journalist and I can maybe try and interview John Peel. And I will get, get to meet John Peel and uh, that would be better than meeting Pele. So, and that's exactly what happened. Pele rather than Pele. Ended, <laughs> ended up meeting, I ended up meeting Pele as well, but yeah. I met Peel and Peel was my hero. Um, and had been for many, many years. So I ended up, I'll tell you the story very quickly how it happened. Yeah. I, I wrote to him, as you did in those days, yeah. and said, Look, I'd like to interview for my little newspaper in West London. And he wrote back a nice letter saying, Look, I'm very busy, maybe an all time or not. So I did for the only time in my life. I wrote back and said, um, Well, my team, who I play for, Chelsea, <laughs> is playing against your team, Liverpool, in a few weeks' time. Um, and I would like to get the interview before then. Like I hadn't told him I played football. Like I just I worked yeah. him as a journalist. Like, and of course he wrote back a couple of days later. I mean, why didn't you say? <laughs> because for me that was using your celebrity, and also it's damn close to do you know who I am? Yeah, which is very the the antithesis of what I would want to be. Anyway, we met up and got on well and stayed friends for the rest of his life. Um, yeah. So all that you know. So I was, I was writing for the. For them, I was doing some, I ended up doing some reviews for the NME. Um, there was singles reviews for other, what they could mirror, things like that. Do you know um, what, Pat? In front, I'm going to read something to you. Don't embarrass you here. Depeche see, Mode. See before you do it. See before you do it. You're going to say Depeche Mode, aren't you? I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> it says, it says, right, this is from the, the I think the club, the club uh, newspaper. Master and Servant Johnny will remember the song, which is one of their better known ones. I, I quote you. I have never thought Depeche Mode had much to offer. It all too often seems obvious and uninspired, and the present single's no exception. They fill in a comfortable little niche for 12-year-old girls who are beyond Kershaw, Nick Kershaw, and Jones. That's Howard Jones, I take it, but not up to new order. I hope the lead singer has stopped trying to look like Jim Kerr as he hasn't quite got what it takes. Brilliant review. <laughs> I think that's very, very accurate and fair. <laughs> Personally, yeah. now, I would agree with all it's, of that. Uh, it's probably that. So I've done a lot of reviews associates with the single of the week that week. Um, that review uh, changed my life. Totally changed my life. I that particular was, one? Yeah, that partic what you just wrote out, read, read out there. Changed my life completely. Because I'd never been a little smart arse before then. And I said, <laughs> the hell about that little smart arse thing. I got in touch with the band and apologised. Um, and uh, apologised in person when I could afterwards as well. And realised I was going down the wrong path and stop doing that, wouldn't do it again. Don't, no, I couldn't be going with, doing with that smart Alex against artists kind of thing. I didn't like the band at the time. Turns out I was wrong. They actually had some good singles later. Yeah, they did. In fact, when I DJ, I will play the odd Depeche Mode song. So I was wrong, smart Alec, hand up and get there. Never done it since, never written anything like that since. Never, and I do, I do stuff, stuff for Radio 5 Live, Chelsea TV, Channel 5, I used to work for everything. I will give you hopefully information. I will hopefully give you insight. 
If someone does something wrong, they'll tell you, uh, but they'll try and tell you why. Um, smart Alex stuff to make me look good. It's never been done since that was it. That was the last one. Well, at least you were being honest. I don't think you were being pretentious, were you? I think no, no. That must have been how you no. felt at the time. Just, I, mean. I, I thought I was far too clever. I can write. We can all write clever, clever if we want. <laughs> it's much, much harder to write something that it doesn't sound um, cutting for the sake of it. It's mm. much better to write something that is constructed. I should have said in that interview, at that, which I still feel, look, you're a wee bit too obsessed with Jim Kerr. Try and stop doing that. <laughs> Try and look somewhere else. You know, get your own personality through. And he was in the early days. He was, too, he was doing the same dance as Kerr. And I'd seen these bands coming through. So I kind of knew what I was talking about. Um, and they did adapt and change through their career. It could have been done in a different way. Now, had that, you know, publication said, we don't want that different style, I should then have said, well, I'm not your man. So it's a, it's a very interesting that that is often brought up with me. And I'm very quick to say, see when you make a mistake, put your hand up. And I, uh, I got it wrong. I got it really badly wrong in that one. Um, I, but I, I kind of smile because it can made me a better person. Um, and made, hopefully, they, they know that I, I kind of got that wrong. But it's always brought up again. And the caveat's never brought up, I, the, the fact that, hey, that was the one I got wrong. Did they forgive you, Depeche Mode? Mm, doesn't matter if they did or not, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. They're not great. I don't mean them every two weeks. So. <laughs> so I'm just going to take you back, Pat, to uh, you mentioned about, you know, your obsession with music and how it sort of it took precedence over football. Was it a pre-season game at Brentford when you left at half time? <laughs> um, there's a couple of things that people have got wrong about this story, but don't worry, it doesn't make it any worse. Um, it was after my first season with Chelsea and uh, they wanted me to sign a new contract and I wasn't sure. I was thinking of going back and even though I got player of the year. And uh, Ken Bates had got me in his, his room to get a new contract and uh, eventually, long vol story, eventually agreed uh, to sign this contract. And just as I was about to put pen to paper, I went, nah, end of the season. I'm not saying it unless I can go off at half time in tonight's game against Brentford. It was a postseason game. And the manager went, what? I'm not saying unless I can go off at half-time. This game's just a Who, nice manager? match. John Neal was the manager. And I said, I said, well, and he said, why are you not signing? I said, well, I want to go to see a gig. <laughs> Central <laughs> London. <laughs> and he went, it's New Order. Called the Twins had played early, and it was New Order were playing that night. And uh, he just looked at me, and Ken Bates was going, I don't believe this guy. <laughs> I just couldn't understand. I said, look, it's the end of the season. It's a, it's, a, it's a game. Yes, it's a game and I'm playing for Chelsea, but if I play the first half, I can just go and play, go to the gig. And they went, all right. And I've never had a contract before where a guy refuses to sign it because he wants to go and see the gig. <laughs> and I signed it. And uh, I actually had my kit on underneath my clothes, but I went so quickly to get down to the South Bank where uh, the Festival Hall, where the, the gig actually was. So yeah, it was, it was common. I did unusual things. I mean, I remember going to Hacienda one we played Manchester City once. Uh, it was live on TV. Really unusual thing. Friday night, live on TV. Chelsea game, Man City. We beat them two uh, 0 um, I scored one of the goals. Got man of the match. Bobby Charlton was very nice about me. And afterwards, I mean, the team went back, but I didn't. I went to the Hacienda. Now the Hacienda, for people who don't know, nobody went to the Hacienda then. It was this beautiful, big, amazing building with nobody there. You know, Manchester hadn't happened. You know, all the stuff that happened after that, the Happy Mondays hadn't happened. New Order, Stroke Factory Records had opened this fantastic place to no one. <laughs> and I just went, and it was brilliant. And then I ended up sleeping in the station um, on a bench and then got the milk train back down. And, you know, it's really weird having 15 million people watching you live on telly get my own match and then you sleep on a bench. And, Manchester yeah. Piccadilly <laughs> Station that you night. You say that you're getting a lot of blank looks from obviously people like John Neal and Ken Bates are unlikely to be sort of indie music fans. Did, did you have any um, sort of cohorts, um, you know, other players who you uh, perhaps unusually did share a, a love of music with or that type of music? Not that type of music generally. Um, I've pushed a lot of stuff with, towards uh, Lasso um, mm. when he can, but you know, he's got his own tastes. Um, Everyone's got their own taste. I mean, if you think of the people that like the kind of music I liked at the time, Joy Division or I've cocktails and listened to Peely, 
it was a very, very small subset of society that were into that. So that would be the same in football. So very few, nobody at the club at the time. But I was interested in all types of music. If you listen to John Peel show, you will be interested in all types of music. So Paul Cannibal had good, heavy reggae beats and did some DJing yeah. himself. Um, some of the other players, you know, there was a set types of stuff if they liked. I would say, right, well, I know that stuff, it's chart. I'm not really interested in it. But if you're into matching into country and western music, well, I'm interested to talk. It's a, a genre, its own, its own, own thing. So why not be interested and love that? It might not be the thing I share. But I, I wasn't in any way, you know, snobbish about it. I was fanatic. I love classical music. I've always loved classical music. I love ballet. You know, so it's not just pigeonhole one area, you know. There's other things you can do and see and love. Just the same as none of the other players shared any of them. <laughs> Yeah. You, you did some Barry DJ. Horner Everton. Barry Horner Everton. Yeah, was, well, yeah, Barry. Like a Barry's, of he's a bit Barry's music fan, isn't he? Yeah. His, no, his knowledge of indie music is just off the yeah. score. Um, I went to Glastonbury with him once. Yeah. Late night. I remember, from, I said, my last text I sent to him was about a year or two ago. I said, hey, have you heard this band, Pink Shiny Ultra Blast? And he sent it back going, of course. <laughs> 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 That's Barry. And Barry. Yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. He's the only, he's, uh, probably apart from you, the only footballer I've ever had a conversation about Nick Cave and the bad seeds yeah. with. I think, you know, the, that's the kind of guy, yeah, top bloke. Well, we have arguments about who knows more about the Cocteau Twins near him. Um, <laughs> it's, it's a good argument. It's a good battle. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he's they, teaching now. He, is Barry teaching? Yeah. Uh, back in teaching in Chester, uh, last I, I knew. Um, he's a brilliant guy who's on the management committee with me. We, we were a year or so together, very short time together at Everton. Um, like, in fact, less than me. Um, so it was actually later in the time we never spoke about it, and then we realised well, we've actually got this shared interest. Um, it just doesn't I mean if I, I probably look like the type, but Barry and play like the type with, with like yeah. the indie music. Barry doesn't. No. <laughs> just, no. So there was that. There was there's been others. It's been just a couple of nights before talking to you here. Um, I was at I was at a game West Ham versus Chelsea, um, and there was Stuart Pearce sitting beside me. And yeah, of, course. Sure, of course, big, big punk fan. Uh, yeah. The background that you've got there, Chris, would be perfect for Stuart. Um, his knowledge of, yeah. particularly punk, but you know, other yeah. music. Every time Pierce and I meet, meet up, we just share band names. And I, I told him last night, you've got to see this band, Spook School. Get a chance to see Spook School go. Right? They, wow. you know, it's, they might not be around forever. And I adore them with a passion. And there's usually about 10 of us in the audience at the moment. <laughs> yeah, I'm not aware of them. I must say, what sort of yeah. music is that? Um, it's like the undertones meets the best of jangly pop. Wow. But with better tunes. Can't go too far any, wrong with, with that, can you? With, with better tunes than just about any of those bands that I know. Wow. You know, they, honestly, wow. in, in a I'll different era, around. they would have been household names, these kids. And they are stunning. I, I went to a gig recently in Edinburgh, a spook school played. And there was about 15, maybe 20 people in us. Place in Edinburgh. It's about, about nine months ago, whatever. And I looked around, and the people that were around me were similar people who were watching Joseph K and the Fire Engines and all that back in the day, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And people who just that's our love. We that's what we do. We go see gigs. And uh, I, we kind of nodded. And at the end of the gig, I went over to one of them who I've known for thirty odd years, maybe more than that, going to gigs forever. And he said, and I said, "What do you think of that?" He goes, "That could be the best gig I've ever seen." I was like, what? Wow. <laughs> this is a guy who, I remember, I remember meeting him in, in Edinburgh at a gig where Simple Minds were showing their new album, New Gold Dream. And it was this beautiful, polished, gorgeous thing with lots of singles on it. And I remember that time thinking, yeah, they're going to be huge. Yeah. <laughs> I can see that. And this guy, guy had said, look, they're some of the best songs I've ever heard. So there's music out there. I gave that to Stuart, Stuart Pierce. The lovely thing about uh, Psycho, Pierce. Uh, Played against them for 19 years for all the teams I played for and indeed Scotland for young men and never spoke a word, never said a word to him. He never said a word to me, never shook a hand all those years. So you think about that whole time and all the time I thought, I mean, I got on well, by the way, <laughs> but the psychology was so strong. He was about intimidation. That's one of his things he used. I'd studied psychology, so I knew what was going on, so I would use my psychological tricks on him. So it was a complete blank, be blank, be blank all the time. Um, anyway, eventually, I, when I stopped playing, I, 
I was writing for a magazine called Goal Magazine. And I thought, I'm going to interview Stuart. Honestly, two minutes of the conversation, best mates. <laughs> Just <laughs> absolutely best. We knew. But for yeah. those two decades, we couldn't say it. <laughs> yeah. So there's, there's people out there who are within football who have got interest in some mm -hmm. in music. But I mean, I'm still waiting for the first, because a lot of the music I've listened to the last 10 years or so, like Bell and Sebastian and Camera Obscura and a lot of those kind of bands are, are kind of a bit more modern and they're mm -hmm. listening. Don't know about yourself, but I went to a band called Cigarettes After Sex recently. Yeah, yeah. amazing in concerts. Yeah. There's a lot of good stuff around, um, and, I, and I, I've not heard any new footballers come out. They come out with different <laughs> stuff they're into, but it's not exactly mainstream. But it's a, a very kind of specific genre. Yeah, it's quite it's a broad even... sweep, Pat. I mean, we, we were discussing the other day, John and I. Uh, and John is into a band called Fontaine's DC. You, you, you probably know them from, from from Dublin, and they're you know they're sort of archetypal. Kind of a bit one pace for me, but 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 modern post -punk post -punk band. Is that yeah. you still listening to that kind of stuff, or have you gone beyond? Very that? white. No, it's very white, very very white. That's that's the thing. I mean, I, somebody said to uh, Colin Murray, oh man, man, always winds me up and said, oh, if you need to know about Page Anglo music, ask Pat. That's all he listens to. It. And I'm thinking, yeah, I did like the Go Betweens. I love the Go Betweens, yeah. but you know, I also like Jesus and Mary Jane, and I also yeah. like you know lots of other bands like uh, My Bloody Valentine. They don't sound then like each other. No, <laughs> oh no, cocktails don't actually sound like them. They can all lump in a lot of this stuff together, but so wider than that, I'd go to see you know lots of different types of music, and I do love lots of different types of music. But it, the thing for me, it has it's no point following uh, you know, what is the norm. I'm not interested. Yeah. You know, I'm, I love the fall. I've always loved the fall. They're going Who to does get John going? Lots of know. people, unfortunately. <laughs> I, I, they're one of my favourite bands as well, Pat. Yeah, yeah so we're, so we're I've been loving yeah. this all, right? Yeah. But you know, and, and but if you're going to go and there's a lot of chart music that will sound the same in two years' time, and I, and and I've also got a tin ear for certain types of music, and I know that that's my fault. It's, it's the weirdest thing to say. I don't get ballads. I've never got ballads. <laughs> Just to get it. One person have a guitar. There was one. You one, define but, a ballad, really, doesn't it? I mean, well, you know, there, there's ballads and ballads. I mean, there's like yeah. power ballads that are just awful and dreadful. Yeah. And, I, I, and I, there's, I, there's, there's, one, on the other hand, there's Neil Young and Bob Dylan and people like that who you could say do ballads. Rolling Stones do the odd one, don't they? Angie Wild Horses. It's only more well, than one pace, isn't it? I mean, you know, a ballad to me. I mean, very interesting. You should say. I mean, uh, John, I know you've got a you've got a pet hate. You love the Fall, and you can't stand Bell and Sebastian. But Pat, you just said you love both of those bands. That's yeah, really I interesting. And I, I think Bell and Sebastian are brilliant too. Their first album was sensational. Well, you know, back at you know when, when you well, it was mid nineties now, wasn't it? But but that kind of that fitted into that sort of Glasgow sound, didn't it? That jangly pop, which I love too. But the They've gone in other directions since then, and some of it's been good, some of it's been less good. Um, my favourite ever time I've DJed was they curated a festival, um, and it was like I was—I I think I, I actually was in heaven that day. Which one was that? Um, so it was a festival that was down at the the Butlins down in. Uh, I went to it. I was there. I've got the ticket stuff. Is the, that the one the with the two? The Bully Two one. Were you there? Yeah, I was DJing that night. The last no, night. The first. Nineteen ninety nine. I remember the date was that that may have been Bully God's One. Speed, you Black Bully Emperor, two. Flaming Lips, uh, John Spencer's no, no. Explosion. I was, I was no, the first was one. Bully, that was ninety nine. Bully Two. Ah, Bully right. Two. Was, it's, it's the precursor to all tomorrow's parties. But that, that yeah. first one was sensationally good. Everyone was there. It was a teenage fan club, Divine Comedy. Uh, John Peel was down there. Uh, that was. Been, you're absolutely right. That 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 was heaven. For me, it was. Franz Ferdinand were there. Bill and Sebastian were doing it, Joan Cope was there, yeah. it was, it, the, the Teenage Fan Club were there as well. Um, and I ended up being the main DJ for the last night. Oh, wow. And, every, and, and honestly, I, I was just in utter heaven because I knew the audience, I knew what it wanted to hear, I knew what I wanted to yeah. hear. The place just went <laughs> mental. And it was, <laughs> but it ruined my life slightly because I'd always kept it quiet that I was a DJ. I'd just done it for friends. You know, yeah. It's not about celebrities it's because you like doing things. But of course, that was exactly when Twitter started. So I was at the next day, um, I was doing a game, Arsenal versus, I think it was Man United, and I had to get a band name into the commentary because I always put band names in. <laughs> so this band that I like called The Pains of Being Pure at Heart. How do you get The Pains of Being Pure at Heart in the commentary, right? And I have to get this on Radio 5 Live. And uh, so eventually, 
uh, I'm, I'm talking about Arsene Wenger and I said, yeah, that's, about, that's the thing about Arsene, you know, he always wants to do things the right way and it, it doesn't matter, he will maybe overpass him, but he always wants it to be beautiful, good football, but sometimes it just won't work and those are the pains of being pure at heart. They don't always work for you, right? So I've got it in, right? Twitter went mental. Everyone had been there the night before mentioned the fact that I'd been DJing, yeah. how well it went. There was this stuff about the pains that I'd done on Five Live. In the space of two days, my little secret about DJing was gone. <laughs> it was some ruined. And I, to be honest, ever since then, it's not been as much fun. And that's, you still do, you're still uh, DJing, aren't you? I remember uh, uh, yeah. friend, a mutual friend, Gideon Co., uh, does sets at Shacklewell Arms, doesn't he, in Dawson? I noticed he had you down there. So you clearly still enjoyed doing it. Yeah, I, I do it now and again. My, my slight problem is, um, like Peely, I'm not, never, we're not Peely's, but um, I want to play your stuff. Mm. I, I hear, this is, look what I found, look what I hear, this is new, you like this kind of thing. Yeah. There, it's kind of harder, just at the moment, um, to get people to listen. They want the classic indie, and I can go and play classic indie dance stuff all night long. I'll give you five hours, six hours of that, and I'll make you dance all night. That's not difficult. The new stuff and the different stuff and the challenging stuff that I would be interested in, not just all night challenging, people are there for a good time. Um, but that was the thing that's kind of maybe stopped me doing it as much recently is that I don't know if people are quite as open to new stuff um, as before. And I've, I'll put a new track on and I'm thinking, you're going to love this in a year. So yeah. listen to it. But no, I, I want the, the shout along, sing along, put on common people again. I'm thinking, yeah, no, I know. Copy of the Sun here, uh, Pat, and it says DJ Blue, Chelsea legend Pat Nevin is now a hipster DJ playing at a club <laughs> uh, club night in trendy East London. So you clearly made your mark. That was in, that was in the the um, yeah that was scared to dance club night called scared, yeah, scared to dance. That's the one you were talking about. Uh, yeah, that's, that's that, that place we, we saw Kieran Leonard there, Chris. Yeah, yeah, the second one. Nice, nice like Kieran game. Leonard, uh, Pat. No, no, that's. I should check him out. Me. Fantastic. You see, as soon as anyone ever says that, I write it down. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But that's the, the essence of what we do, isn't it? I mean, you just written that. I, I, that's how I operate too. Somebody says, you, you, "Have you heard this?" And I go, "No, I haven't." You know, and it's a. Uh, I'm the same. John's the same. You know, I, yeah. I, 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 you thrive on new things, don't you? I can't listen to the same stuff all the time. I have to hear new music, and it, it leads in different directions. And that's the essence of of being a music fan, isn't it? Being an active music fan, not force fed by whatever the radio gives you. Exactly, and it's. It doesn't make it different, better than anyone else. It's just we have a different interest. We have a different love and a passion for it. And it's that moment. It's that gorgeous. There's a couple of moments. The moment when you hear something, you think, ah. Yeah. I mean, how often does it really happen? You know, it happens, it still happens fairly regularly for me. But, you know, yeah, that song, it hits you and you go, and it, it can be such a different type. I remember um, the last fall session and they played blindness, strike called blindness. Yeah, yeah, played yeah. The session. Fantastic. And honest to God, I was gasping for yeah. that. This is incredible. It was amazing. Yeah. And they, they re released it in the album. It wasn't anywhere near as good, but the session was yeah. I think that was arguably their last really, really great song, Blindness, perhaps. I, would, before he so, and, but I can remember the moment I was halfway through yeah. hearing it thinking, wow. You know, and yeah. as I, I mentioned, that spook school. I remember seeing them for the first time Sunday. It was down, it was in Dalston. And I went along and I just thought, well, that was a great tune. Well, that was I'm a great write, tune as well. I'm going to write them down as well. About eight, about, about eight tunes and I'm going, how many great tunes have you all got? Like, <laughs> <laughs> so the first two albums, or three albums came there, the first two albums just, and it's, funnily enough, it's one of those ones where now and again a track hits you. And it's yeah. half, I remember the, the first hearing, again, it was a Peel session, it was a camera show, Obscura doing Love My Gene uh, for a Peel yeah. session. And I was halfway through the song, and I've got a pen and a paper out, and I'm like that, mm. right? <laughs> and I went to see them two nights later. And by a week later, they were my favourite band in the world. <laughs> yeah. Who I hadn't heard of a week before. They're and Glaswegian the as well, weren't they? The Glaswegian? Yeah, Tracy Ann's one of the... Yeah, I've seen it in a great band. Great pop band. Can I throw... Talking of Glasgow, uh, and this is something which, which has, has cropped up. We did a, 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 one of these shows with, um, with John Moss, who you probably know, the, the, the referee who... You, 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 as a media pundit yourself, we went to his record shop in Leeds, and the, the name he came out with was a new one on me, and it was Jerry Cinnamon. Now, yeah, this guy, yeah, definitely, definitely, guy, definitely, right? definitely, Now, yeah. listen, I mean, 
I don't like his music particularly, but uh, he is a self-made superstar. It's, it's just come from you know playing gigs and you know which is a tremendous achievement really. Now you know for, for me and probably for you, John, it's kind of it's kind of laddish indie. You know, ten pints and a sing-along chorus, which is not my cup of tea really. Yeah, no. But I mean. Where do you stand on that, Pat? I mean, it's an incredible achievement. He, he plays to sort of 50,000 fans, doesn't he? And he's done it overnight, pretty much all on his own, just by strumming his guitar and, and singing sort of Oasis-style songs. Exactly. Um, fun enough, I had this conversation two nights ago with Stuart Pearce. <laughs> oh, really? Stuart, <laughs> not, Stuart like him? Yeah. And it would be more Stuart's thing. Yeah. It would be mine. But we're in the same kind of ballpark. And, and fun enough, it's one of the few times, one of the very few bands, my, my son and my daughter both, fanatic about music, but totally different style from me. Um, and my daughter had told me about Jerry Cinnamon a long time ago. So I kind of knew about that from quite some time ago. It wouldn't be absolutely down my street. You know, it's hard to tell why. I sometimes don't know why myself. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's strange. I, just think, well, I, I understand why, why other people like that. And I've a chance, still not seen live but i will at one point get the opportunity to do phenomenal that. achievement though i mean is it a glasgow thing and people say he's, he's he's shot up overnight because it's a kind of that kind of close glasgow thing you know and the music scenes we've seen in the past you know postcard and aztec camera and joseph k and all the rest of it uh, is that is it is it he just got that that local following and it's just spread because they people understand that kind of you know thing mm. there's kind of been a lot of different little places in Glasgow. Glasgow's got an incredibly, we used to have this argument again with people, like I used to say like, see if you take the number of great bands from the Glasgow, Edinburgh area, as in the M8 corridor, who's better, that group or the group from the Manchester Liverpool, that mm. thing, and then you just bat, it's like, it's like band tennis, you bat one back, and he'll bat another back, and I'll bat another back, because they, they produce a lot, now the, a lot of the Scottish ones weren't, absolutely phenomenal and amazingly successful in the end, but quality-wise, and they'll, they go their own way. The glass regions, as you can tell, talk to me, we do our own thing. You know, we don't really care what anyone else thinks. Mm. It's not an arrogance. It's just you do it for the love and the art of it. So the, another band who classically, similarly, Blue Nile, I don't know if you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Nothing like anybody else. And you, they either are or you aren't a cup of tea. I happen to love them, and I, they, they kind of, They've got that Glasgow landscape about them. But you try a music industry person and say, right, this is what we're going to do. We're going to release an album every eight years. It's going to be nothing like anything else that's around just now. You're going to have a tiny following who will follow you to the end of the planet. That's your idea, you know. And you think, well, that's a stupid idea. <laughs> but it isn't. It's because of the art of it. And Jerry's got a bit of that as well, isn't it? You go down your own route of what is your art and do it for the love of it. Yeah. And that's... See, we've got this big thing of, in Glasgow, there's one band that really weren't, there was two bands that really weren't really that liked, okay, within Glasgow, as I remember it. One was Wet, 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 and the other was Texas. And yeah. the reason being is, we're chasing the buck. Yeah, and yeah very mainstream, weren't they? Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with that. No. But it, it seems like snobbishness, but from Glasgow, it's, it's fine, that's, you do that, but it's not the same as what we're doing. Yeah, the bands are doing. a Deacon Blue yeah. Scottish as well. I'd follow yeah, they are, yeah. that yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah. Enough, he's, um, he's Ricky's changed that wee bit because he does a show, a music show up here, and it's a great music show. Oh, right. Okay, and you see his background, he's got other things. And funnily enough, I, I worked for years uh, with a drummer, um, because he was he was a presenter for Scottish football. <laughs> Do you, oh, right, I point <laughs> was a presenter for Scottish football <laughs> as well as drummer for Deacon Blue, um, and I worked for him for years. We need to talk about your book, Pat, which is coming out. And, and I, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's called Accidental Footballer. Which yeah, is um, I, th I think it's going to be called that because I just presented it the other day. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I wrote it over a, a period of time, about three or four weeks, and just had to get it out. Something had happened, and I had to write this, this story. And it's, it's really nice because it's an unusual way to do it. Um, as a football, write it. And then go to public, different publishers and said, do you want this? You know, and uh, kindly one of them said, yeah, they quite liked it. So I've just tidied it all up and I've, I've just tidied it up. It's taken me a wee while and uh, it should be, I don't know when, maybe six months or so. Mm. But I loved it. I absolutely, I, mean, I write anyway. I've always written anyway, but I've put this off for a long, long time. 
Have you done it all yourself, no ghostwriter? I'm almost offended you ask. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> but every song with every chapter, a song title, right? Yeah, yeah. I wonder if I could then. Give, give us a few of the chapters. Come on. Um, anyway, so you say that, then we have to try and find <laughs> You see, I'm looking down here. While you're doing that, I would say that um, I'm not a huge fan of footballers' biographies, although, of course, I work in football. I find them all mm -hmm. a, a little bit similar. And, you know, but I, 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 I would be drawn to yours, obviously. Trust me, I'm going to be like there's, that. <laughs> there's as much music as football in it, isn't there? I would okay, think, then. So you. here's a couple of... Uh, do you remember the first time? Yeah. Pulp. Oh, that's, number, that's Pulps. So that's yeah. uh, chapter one. Uh, yeah. Name a chapter, one to 32. And I'll give you 26. Here. 26. Uh, oh, I'll be honest with you by the spook school. <laughs> it's a classic. Sure. I'm happy you made it. What's only... chapter 17? You'll, you'll have shares in their record company soon. <laughs> 17 a bit obvious. Fame, by the way. Fame, yeah. Uh, uh, number 19, absolute sticker. Yeah, kicker conspiracy. Oh, brilliant. Yes, yes. yes. That's the fall so, again. Yeah. 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 And they've yeah. all got a reason for it. London calling, obviously. So, so, and I love the fact that I was able to just put because you, yeah. you always find song titles, you know what it's like, there'll be a song title for anything. But it, yeah, and it's a nice way of sort of suggesting how much of an influence music has been on your life, even though music and football are two entirely disparate things, really. But the fact that we're all here together, you know, there, there is a kind of um, common but link, perhaps. It works, it works as a playlist as well, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a really good thing. So I, did, I could come up with that idea. Millions and millions of ideas. I don't know how, how many of them there were. You're right, it's not, it's not a football biography. No. There's, there's a bit of football in there, but it, I'm, it didn't really interest me greatly writing that much about the intricacies. Oh, I scored this goal then, and it yeah. was a cracker. Yeah, kind of, you know, yeah, yeah that's, that's what I thought. I'm not going to get any of that. It's just <laughs> not that good. That's a job, and this is your interest, right? Yeah. It, yeah. Doesn't, it doesn't interest me. It ain't going to interest the reader, so it's not, it's not there. <laughs> And there's, there's some psychology stuff about what I went through in it, but it's basically weird things that happened during my career. That un, unexpectedly, there's one chapter, the, almost the entire chapter, um, I'm trying to, uh, what's, it, what's it go under? Uh, it'll be Big Mouth Strikes again. Oh yeah, and I was going to say that would be a Smith's one. <laughs> it's just, just me and Morrissey. We had the night. <laughs> All and right. Myself, him and a guy, a great friend of mine called Vinnie Riley. Yeah, the Deruti column. column. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we had this evening. And what happened in this day and the build up to it and afterwards is an amazing story. I won't bore right. you with it. Just no. like it well, 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 we'll read about it. I mean, uh, just, do, I so think Vinny Riley played on Morrissey's first solo album, didn't he? Was it around that he time? He wrote a lot of the songs. Yeah, Vinny? yeah, he did. Um, so, you know, there, there's all, I'm trying not, I don't need to sell just now because it's not going to be out for a long time. So yeah, well, I've forgotten fine. about it. But honestly, <laughs> I love doing it. Um, yeah. And I loved writing about the things and the people that I'd seen as an outsider within football. But also, you know, you end up getting a little, you know, a step into meeting other really interesting and unusual people. And it was lovely to be able to do that. And to be able, within two chapters, to talk about meeting Saddam Hussein and meeting Morrissey. You know, it's kind of good. <laughs> and the stories involved in both of them. Morris is about as popular as Saddam Hussein these days, isn't he? <laughs> I'll leave that comment to you. <laughs> that ending, as, as we started, you used the word outsider at the end, and it, uh, you're an outsider at the beginning. Uh, it's, it's been a fascinating life, um, and we look forward to reading that. But when's it out? Do you know? I have no idea. Um, I've got I've everything from the... It's all finished. I, but I think with COVID, it's kind of everything's getting moved back. Uh, that's all for marketing people to do. I don't know that world. Although I do actually, I study marketing, but look, I've produced a piece of art, whatever, uh, the piece of work, and I'll hand it over. And then what well, you want to do it, do it. But it's my writing. And that's, that's the important thing. If it sells 2,000 or 200,000, it kind of doesn't matter to me either way. It's a piece of work that I'm kind of interested in giving it to people to read and hopefully enjoy. And there, can I tell you very quickly before we end, the reason why I was kind of spurred on to do it, the intro explains why. I was a bit annoyed with somebody. But it was another reason. I read all the time, a fanatical reader, but I read Adam Kay's book two years ago. Um, and I don't know if you've read Adam Kay's book. Um, and, oh, sorry, this, this is going to hurt. I'd advise anyone to read it. And I realized that you could write a memoir, 
Oh, it's about, a, is it a doctor? Uh, yes. Is it a doctor? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. And I read that. I've heard, I've heard of it, but not read it. Trust me, just go. <laughs> the funniest book since Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Really? It's, it's the funniest book since then. And, and my daughter's a doctor as well, so I, I kind of we and we read, it, read it together and understood it. Right? But um, I read it and realised, I'd be, no, I can't copy that style, I can't do that style, but I'd realise this is a voice that I can have. The voice is, I'm not telling you about the ins and outs of you know, putting a cross in. I'm yeah. telling you something else that hopefully you might find weird and funny as an outsider within an industry. Um, and if we have tried, I've tried to do it with that kind of feeling with lots of fun, with lots of fun. Uh, and that's maybe the problem. When I was younger, I was a wee bit too earnest and my own good. Sometimes I had reason to be, um, but it wasn't really who, who I was. When you met me in person, I was never that earnest really, but in, the, in front of the cameras, I was always too earnest. Um, so it was showing where I was going in that journey and the fun I had along the way. And it's, it was great fun writing. And I only got to the age of 20, <laughs> 26 in the book. Wow. What happens after that gets really weird. That's, I mean, that's, really that's weird. That's going to be the sequel. The sequel. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll write the sequel. Yeah. But I don't that's know if I'll ever come out about it. We're just about out of time. Thanks ever so much. Uh, we look forward to listening to you on Radio 5, doing your football stuff as well. The accidental football pundit, <laughs> whatever it is. But, yeah, uh, that was well. Great to listen to your musical <laughs> thoughts. And um, like us, you know, we were, we were always exploring. So thanks so much. Best of luck to the, uh, to, 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 with the new book. And thanks for joining us on Rock and Goal. Thanks, An man. absolute pleasure, guys. Cheers. Thanks. Cheers.